Haven, and uh, my business is Ain't Misbehaving Dog Training. Um, I'm a certified pet dog trainer and a certified nose work instructor. Um, and I have been training for, it's a bad thing when you start to lose track. I believe it's 14 or 15 years now. What's that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, so, so I've been um, doing this for a long time and um, one of the things that often comes up is uh, impulse control. And um, so I just wanted to ask a couple of questions really quickly um, for you guys. And uh, one is, um, how many of you guys have dogs? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> how many of you have two dogs? More than two? More than three? More than a dozen? <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, and uh, how many of you guys would say that you have impulse control? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, and the other thing I was going to say is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about this. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask me. I may say to you at the end, you know, if it's too involved, just to hold your question to the end. But um, feel free to ask questions um, during. Sorry. Hi there. It's okay. Welcome. My garments have been all over the place. Well, oh, no. well, you're here. I am. Yes. Welcome. Um, so yeah, so feel free to ask any questions um, during the presentation. Um, so um, let's see. Now I press. I'm a little new to this. I you know I, I teach classes all the time, and yet right now I'm like, oh my gosh, there's all these people sitting and looking at me. So um, I'll try to maintain my cool. Um, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. This is something I think is really important about impulse control because we're talking about impulse control in dogs. And I was asking people about you know, their level of impulse control. Um, and one of the things that I'm finding a lot is that people are extremely distracted. Their attention is divided, they're distracted, they're thinking of other things. So when it comes to training their dogs, they're not always there. And um, so before I get into the, the dog part, um, of course, we need to talk about the human part. Um, and I think this is really important because, um, you know, I don't I need to go through the list, but really the big thing is being patient and present and follow through and being observant. Because I see this all the time. I get lots of phone calls about these dogs being out of control and I might go to the home or they may come to me and there's a little consistency <laughs> in um, the dog's behavior and the person's behavior. So I think it's really important to think about the human component because as we all know, we really do influence our dogs. So something to keep in mind, we can all be better people. Um, things I'm just gonna talk about, and I know you guys are all, I don't wanna sound like I'm um, being condescending at all. Everybody is very experienced in this room. So um, I'm hoping that I'm not oversimplifying um, so I'm going to talk about management, training, and nose work, because I love nose work. I can't not talk about nose work. Um, does everybody know what nose work is, canine nose work? Does anybody not know what that is? Does it, okay, great, so I don't need to explain what the heck. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to talk about these two things, and the first thing I want to talk about is management. And so um, whenever we're talking about impulse control, um, I always want to talk about crates, gates, leashes, and subtle spots. Um, and one thing I wanted to go back to, which I forgot to mention, is um, how many of you guys work with adolescent dogs or have adolescent dogs? Um, I think that impulse control is probably, we're primarily talking about adolescent dogs. Um, certainly it, it's not exclusive to that, but that's a lot of what we're working with. And um, I don't know about you guys when you're working with people, but I feel like there needs to be a support group because people get so frustrated with their adolescent dogs um, and that, you know, I'm always saying impulse control, impulse control, impulse control. Um, so I just wanted to back up and say that we're primarily talking about um, adolescent dogs. Um, and then I would say the second big group are dogs that have been um, recently adopted um, from shelters. So that it's the first time they're um, in a new home and um, somebody's not spent a lot of time with these dogs, so integrating them into a household. 
So um, a big thing is um, I don't need to go into about crate training. Um, do you guys feel like you struggle with um, talking to people about the pros of crate training? Is that is that a yes? Yes. There are some people that that just say, "Well, my dog's doing okay." Right. Right. And then within you know yeah. days, they're not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm not going to go into about crate training, but. I just, I can't emphasize enough. Crates are so important. Um, and um, I, I feel like the thing that I'm constantly repeating is that crates are not a bad thing and it's not a punishment. It's not a punishment, it's a safe place. And I like to make the analogy, you know, of all of us had our bedrooms <laughs> when we were kids and we like to be in our bedrooms but we didn't necessarily love to be sent to them. But it was a place where we could be. So, um, I talk a lot about crates and really talking about management and getting people to try to buy into um, crate training. Um, the other thing is a subtle spot. And um, I went to a conference uh, years ago, APDT, um, and Trish King was there. Um, is everybody familiar with Trish King? She's at Marin County. And she's one of these people that she's, you know, says the most practical things. And she was talking about, she called it a tie down. <laughs> And I thought for Portland that wasn't appropriate. So uh, I thought settle spot. I mean, here you have to be careful about saying command and um, say um, your request. Um, and we don't call it a tie down, but we call it a settle spot. Um, how many of you guys um, talk about settle spots? Do you guys? Yeah. OK, great. This is another thing um, that I'm constantly emphasizing. Because it's a way of integrating dogs into the home it's a, do it's a way of teaching dogs what you want, appropriate behavior. It's teaching them to self-calm. And it's also giving people a break so that people can be consistent. Because you can't train any of us. We can't be consistent 100% of the time without having some way of managing. So I think settles um, are a huge, huge tool to be used. Um, I have volunteered and I volunteer at Multnomah County Animal Shelter and I've had nine foster dogs. Um, I finally failed <laughs> with my last foster dog and he's a border terrier, perhaps Chihuahua mix. And I call him the id because he's really impulsive. How many of you guys have terriers? Yeah, I want it, I want it, I want it now, I want it. So, um, and all the foster dogs that have come through my home we have worked with settle spots. And I have the settle spot in my office, I have one in my kitchen, I have one in my bedroom. And so I basically, I practice it two to five times, if not more, I just have them in the settle spot. Um, I'll use a Kong, I'll use some type of, um, uh, something for them to chew on. But basically what I wanna to start to teach them is where they need to go when they need to calm themselves down. Um, and we have to teach it to them. Um, it just doesn't come naturally. Um, I know um, for any of us, we, how many of us had uh, monitors on the, on the school grounds? You know, there was a teacher that said, you can't run around that like that and hit. Um, so it's a similar thing where we need teaching them to um, have a spot um, and do it in a low stress environment. Um, a lot of times people will say, you know, how many of you guys run into this where people are just their dogs totally out of control and that's when they start to take action. And it's really hard because everybody spun out. So that's that observant, be observant, um, and use the settle spot and practice it. And then the beauty of it is it becomes the go-to for your dog. Um, and um, I do use leashes. Um, I know there's different ways. Um, some people will click, um, use a clicker to teach a settle spot. There's multiple ways. The way I do it is I have a, some type of bed or a blanket or towel. I have a leash. I give my dog something to chew on. I ask them to settle a low stress environment. I totally ignore them. And um, I do it two to five times. I recommend it two to five times a day and integrating it, integrating it into a routine. So around meal time, around um, you know, a book, TV, computer, anything. Are yeah. you using the leash just to walk into the spot? Or yes, a tether. Uh, tether. Yeah, and, and that way, and the reason for that is what I've found that when, when you're continually you know, asking them to go, now you're engaged in attention, potentially attention-seeking behavior. And so what I want to be able to do is say, here you are, settle, good dog, 
I'm going to make my dinner. Um, and then what I like to do is I reinforce that subtle spot. You know, the dog's being calm, and then all those good things happen in those subtle spots. And I really encourage, encourage people to think about, you know, how it pertains in their, their home. So a lot of people will say to me, between eight and nine, my dog is crazy. And so I say, great. <laughs> this is a perfect time for you to be proactive. And if you know that you have fed your dog, you've walked your dog, you've done the things that, you know, the other things that need to happen, then ask your dog to settle, give them a stuffed Kong, give them something to chew. So you redirect them right there. Um, so that is a huge tool. Um, I talk about it all the time. And then I remind people, I'm doing a, I call it continuing ed. And so one of the things that constantly comes up is, you know, all the things that the dogs are repeatedly doing. And I go back to the settle spot. How many settle spots do you have? How often do you practice settle spot? When do you, all, all the above. Um, and then the other thing, as the dogs get experienced, you can um, phase out the leash, um, phase out, you know, inter you're doing intermittent Kongs, things like that. So as Trish King said, that is one of the best tools that you can use. Thank you, Trish King. Um, and then, um, let's see, training. Developing the cerebral cortex. I think that's correct. I think that's the part of the brain. I know that there's somebody who really knows about brains here. <laughs> so I hope that's what I'm using correctly. But, um, you know, developing the cerebral cortex. How many, of you guys, how many of you guys run into that my dog thinks that training is boring? And then I say, oh, what do you think about training? Do you think training is boring? Um, and so if you're not buying into the training, then your dog is certainly not going to buy into it. So I talk about quality basics. So. Um, one of the things people will ask, I do a beginner and then I do a continuing ed, and people will say, well, well, what will we learn new in continuing ed? And I'll say, you'll master the basics. And it's, it's not about precision. It's about patience. It's developing impulse control. It's developing that learn to earn. It's developing waiting for um, a release. So one of the things I really emphasize is varying commands um, and getting your dogs to buy in. Because I know um, a lot of people find basic training boring. And then their dogs do, and their dogs don't really buy in, and it becomes kind of a drag for everyone. So really varying it, varying you know, different environments, different um, requests, um, and different duration. And then really thinking about setting up controlling the dog's environment in such a way that they're motivated. So I talk about working for food um, and talking, or working for um, toys and uh, life, life rewards. So I think some of, sometimes the life rewards are the most um, powerful rewards for a dog. Um, and, that's a, and, then, and I find that, you know, I'm talking about, you know, if you are bringing your dog to an off-leash area, Having your dogs do some, ex uh, maybe a sit stay or a down stay or a wait or a touch or s a couple things before you're letting them off leash. Somewhere where your dog is highly, highly motivated um, and they need to be focused for a split second before you're about, I shouldn't say split second, a split five seconds before you let them off. Um, the other thing is, um, I have a lot of people say to me, um, they feel like their dogs uh, make them feel like they're in a rush. Do you get that? That people feel like they're always rushing and that they, that they need to reward really quickly and they should release because it has to be instant. And so um, a really big part of impulse control is just slowing it down, um, patience. Um, and so another big part of this quality basics is um, how many of you guys run into people talking about trouble walking on leashes? Dogs, really, yeah. That's, is that, would you say that's your number one? How many people um, run into uh, leash walking as number one? Yeah, number one. Number two would be recall, maybe? What would you say is number two? Any? Jumping, Jumping. Jumping. mm-hmm, yeah. Leashes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, where's your leash? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, leashes, I mean, sorry, jumping and um, leash walking. And so another, 
place where I really work on impulse control is, and there, here's the observant part, is that as soon as your dog starts to get excited, picking up the leash, walking towards um, an area where leashes are, or what I find in people's homes, I do a lot of private sessions, is that there are people that are very organized, so everything is, you know, here are my shoes that I walk the dog with, here are the, you know, here are the leashes, so the dogs are all cued in about that, and there's the rest of us who aren't quite so organized in our home environment, where are my shoes? Um, so, and uh, so they never know what's gonna happen. Um, <laughs> keeps it interesting. Um, so working right there, working with, as soon as you pick up that leash, if the dog is jumping a mile high, that's where we're working it. We're starting right there, starting to work with teaching the dog to calm, maybe wait, a sit, a sit stay, a down stay, maybe multiple sit, release, sit, release, whatever it is to get the dog mixing it up so the dog is interested and then really working around the doorway. That's another one in my, I sound like a broken record, settle spot, doorways. How many you find that your dogs in your, um, it sounds like a lot of you work with the public and clients, have their dogs crashing through doorways? Yeah, how many dog fights start around doorways? So it's a very uh, pretty, um, I want to say, high activity, potentially um, high level of frustration. So really having people work around doorways um, and getting their dogs to come out slowly. Um, and same thing, I would say, an important threshold, gate to an off-leash area. So um, huge, huge emphasis. Um, got the slow down, developing patience. Soft mouth. How many dogs who have the softest mouths have hard mouths when they get excited? That is another thing um, that I think is one of the most, I want to say simple because it takes time and patience, but it is one of the things that I think, and I, I believe it's chemical, changes your dog's brain. If a dog is grabbing and you're asking your dog to do a sit and I, and I run into this and I'm seeing the dog grabbing, I'm like, whoa. Um, having them be able to take something softly in multiple environments, even when overstimulated, is huge for impulse control. Um, I recently worked with this great little pity name, Oso. Um, and Oso, I think, oh, I think he might originally come from Multnomah County. He might have changed names, I don't know. Um, and he ended up at Pixie Project, and it was maybe a year and a half, he'd recently been neutered. He, very sweet, but he considered the furniture and the house part of his agility course. I mean, leaping off the couch, leaping off the, I mean, he was, I don't think he'd ever been in a home. And his mouth was something to be reckoned with. He had such a hard bite, and the first thing that we did is he was on a tether. We worked with a subtle spot, multiple subtle spots, lots of, he got a lot of Kongs. He got all his meals in the Kong. And so that chewing, that licking, that you know, self-calming and hand feeding. Um, and one of the things that changed him very quickly was the two weeks of hand feeding and teaching him to take a treat softly. It really, you could just see like everything about him just start to decompress. So. It seems so simple, and yet it's such a powerful tool. And so whenever I'm teaching a class, whenever I'm working with anybody privately, I always say, whatever you're doing, if your dog is grabbing, stop and work with a soft mouth right there because that is going to make all the difference in um, your dog's ability to um, be able to bring everything down. Um, interrupted play, another big thing is um, a lot of times people will talk to me about their dogs getting um, out of control um, during play. You know, how many people ask you if it's okay to play tug? Yes. How many of your dog, and how about wrestling? That's another big question that I get. And I say yes, but with rules. And so whenever we're talking about play, and, and not to simplify it, but you know, you don't let kids run around in a parking, I mean a parking lot, never in a parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they should run around in a parking lot. <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, is that impulse control? Um, 
on a, in a playground. Or kids get monitored, you stop their play all the time so they learn to play nicely. I mean, it's the same thing with dogs, and it's a perfect opportunity because people love to play with their dogs. They like to play with their dogs more than they like to train their dogs. Um, and so being able to have some really good impulse control, um, I really like to play a lot. And so um, I, I know some people will have their dogs do a sit every single time they go to play fetch. What I like to do is start a game with a sit, and then I'll just do stop. You know, play a little bit and stop. Play a little bit and stop. Wrestle and stop. Whatever it is so that my dog can have several speeds. Um, and I think about, um, how many of you guys are familiar with a biathlon? Does everybody know what the biathlon is? It's amazing. It's, um, it's a race where you ski uh, about a 20 meter, or I think it's, that's 12 mile race, full on, and then you have to bring it down, and you have to target shoot. And you have to hit every single target, and if you don't, you have to ski more. And I believe you have to ski another, yeah, it's crazy. So it really behooves you to hit the target if you don't want to continue skiing. So I use the biathlon in my mind. I like to ski. That's what I think about with interrupted play. That is impulse control. Being able to be that intense and be able to bring it down like that. And that's what I think about when I'm working and playing with a dog is that concept of being able to have them play and bring it down. Get play, bring it down. So, um, and so what I really work with is, and I, the command is stop, start. Stop, start, stop, start. Or I'll, I'll use the word break. Um, um, with my soft mouth, of course, it's perfect. Leave it and take it. How many of you guys work with take it? as much as leave it. Yeah, both. Um, so it's that on off switch that, um, you know, the leave it, take it, soft mouth, and the interrupted play. And people buy into the play. So um, that's, you know, we, we have to think about people because that's the other end. I, well, I can't use that quote because that's, I was going to say the other end of the leash, but I'd be quoting Patricia McConnell. And the last thing is nose work. Um, so Nose work, I recently um, got certified about a year ago. I've been training my dogs for um, three years. The reason I got interested in nose work was working with a lot of dogs that had some pretty major issues, um, the reactivity, impulse control, um, environmental, sensi environmental sensitivity, shy dogs, and what I saw from dogs doing nose work was a real transformation. Um, a lot of people really, um, you know, it can be tricky if you have a dog with issues, in, and I'm putting issues in quotes, um, in Portland, because the expectation is that you should be able to bring them to an off-leash area, right? You should, every dog should be able to be in a dog park, and a lot of dogs shouldn't be in dog parks. Um, and so, and a lot of people struggle with their dogs that aren't necessarily super social with other dogs. Um, and so nose work is such a great way um, to be able to get your dog some enrichment, some um, engaging their mind. It's incredibly engaging for them. Um, and so, and it also, how many of you, with dogs that are really fearful, I call it the chicken little complex, you know, where they're always kind of looking around and, you know, like, whoa, do you see that thing over there? Oh, God, you know, and they're, they're unable to focus. And so the nice thing with um, nose work is it really starts to engage their senses. I mean, they all know how to smell. Um, and they all know how to hunt um, for their treats. <laughs> um, and it just engages their brain. And it is an excellent, excellent activity for getting dogs to calm down um, and also um, to help them with uh, environmental sensitivity. Um, I teach a nose work class, I've I teach a couple, and uh, Sarah has her two dogs in, now it's, my friends laugh at this, intro to odor, um, and continuing odor class. <laughs> we have specific odors that we work on. Um, and um, one of the things, with permission, that I, we did yesterday, is I'm always using distractors 
There are people who, in nose work who believe that you should have a flat plane, there should be no distractors, so that your dogs can work in you know, the perfect environment. I don't, I, I don't know where that environment is, so I'm always <laughs> thinking about what possibly can I set up? So when I'm working with nose work, I um, have toys, I have a crate, I have a gazillion, I might work, use a bunch of hides on a crate, in a crate. Um, and um, yesterday, Sarah had her daughter there, and it was approval. Um, all the dogs were um, generally okay with kids. And um, Emmy, how old is Emmy? Awesome. Six, and she's sitting in a chair coloring. And I'm like, perfect. I'm going to use her as the, um, the, um, the environmental or um, the, the social um, stress, the social pressure. So I did a bunch of hides around her. And the dogs were like, oh, hey, kid. And they, can, they searched all around her. Meanwhile, she's just like da, 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 drawing, doesn't even notice it's going on. And so it was such a great example of these dogs. And some of the dogs in this class have had um, issues with environmental sensitivity and impulse control that they were like, oh, uh-huh, uh -huh, um, and just continued. So um, it's a great great way of um, working with impulse control. Um, and um, no offense to the agility people. Agility is great, but I get a lot of people, how many of you guys have herding dogs? Yeah, I have, I have had a Kelpie, um, LaRue. Um, I have a rough collie. Um, she's a working type collie, she's four. Um, and Multnomah County used to be really nice and give me all, almost all herding dogs. So, um, except for Leo, who was a wannabe. Um, I call him a collie in disguise. Um, and um, a lot of people with drivey dogs think that agility is great. Um, it's great, but it doesn't develop impulse control. And nose work quiets the mind, and it's, it's the opposite. I mean, how, you know, I, I don't believe that a lot of herding dogs actually need to learn to be more active, <laughs> but they l need to learn to be more quiet. So this is another really, it's a, it's a great activity. And I, I don't want to be, you know, I, I like agility, and I've done some agility with my, um, my dogs. But, um, and my, um, my border terrier likes it more um, than my collie, and my border terrier, Chihuahua, makes, loves nose work. And he was also, he totally lacked impulse control. I mean, he was truly an id. Um, my collie's a super ego. Um, and I looked it up so I'd make sure, because I always, I always refer to them that way, and I wanted to make sure I wasn't actually misspeaking. And so I looked it up on Google. So Dr. Google said yes. <laughs> um, but um, the, um, he doesn't have a lot of impulse control. Um, he's, we're working on it. And man, when he does nose work, he, it really helps him just be able to be calmer and um, be patient and wait for things. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you.